So my name is Martin Spindler. I'm going to talk about the Internet of Things. Um, essentially, um, how uh, we're now taking the web to the everyday. I was just talking to Andy, the second speaker, uh, talking about how I'm much more interested by the mundane rather than the high-out tech, and that's kind of what I want to talk about, because the everyday is where, where it really matters. First, um, a couple of words about myself. Um, my name is Martin Spindler. I'm the co-founder and managing director, a managing director of the Internet of People Limited. We're a network consultancy of uh, people working with clients on Internet of Things business, uh, uh, Internet of Things business decisions. Uh, I'm also a strategy consultant for uh, the Internet of Things and Smart Energy. Um, if you want to find out more about me, just uh, check those links. And right, so that's my business. I'm also the co-founder of a conference in Berlin, the Cognitive Cities Conference, which was looking at a human angle for smart cities. I'm a member of Council of International IoT Think Tank, and I co-founded the Atoms and Bits Festival in Berlin. Um, I always jokingly say, uh, um, if I do talks, I should wear a Formula One sponsor suit with all the labels. But let's get started. Chapter one. Um, about eight years ago, I started studying at uni. Um, took up a job right away um, just to finance my life. And I was working at, as a customer service rep at a energy price comparison site. Uh, so I really was the first line of defense. I was doing a lot of what you'd usually call user research now, uh, just you know, answering questions about energy, trying to paint a picture of what um, people are actually concerned with and what they know about and what their problems are. I was spending a hell of a lot of time explaining what this fabled thing called electricity actually is. Um, and I figured that most people don't actually know how much electricity they use. Just a quick question into uh, the audience. Who of you knows what their annual electricity consumption is? Whoa, that's a lot. That's almost 50%. Usually, usually when I do this, um, it averages at about 15%. Uh, so, well, congratulations to you. You know your shit. Um, so I was talking a hell of a lot about this profound but old-style tech, which most people don't really know a lot about. Um, what well, about at the same time, um, this whole thing bubbled up. Um, we were talking about a lot of web 2.0 folksonomies, blogging. I think Twitter started about a year later. Um, so this whole rebirth of the web uh, coming out of the crash uh, was about that time. Uh, that was about the time that all of you have been person of the year. This is, of course, um, Time Magazine, um, the year Google bought YouTube, which even to this day was for a staggering amount of money. Um, and that was the time when we had the buzzwords of Web 2.0, user-generated content, prosumer. I really didn't like the word prosumer, but it stuck. Because I was coming out of the energy corner, uh, and I was thinking, well, this is kind of a prosumer, right? Um, this is a household that's not only consuming electricity, but producing electricity. That's not what the web consultants meant, of course. Um, but that's how I looked at it, and this is kind of instrumental for, for a lot of things I'm going to talk about, this, this lateral thinking, um, this taking one tech and applying it to a completely different context. Um, what this led us to is a rethink of how we need to manage electricity information, um, how like this once year data point of this is how much you used in any given year is really not enough in that day and age. Um, what it led to was that we now have a fairly simple answer to the question of how much energy do I actually use? Um, 
What I find really interesting, though, is not that screen, uh, but that screen, because uh, with that whole development, we got hobbyists working in that field again. This is the Open Energy Monitor. That's a project mostly done in the UK by now. And this is a completely open source smart energy meter. So I was thinking about, you know, what happens when we think energy with web principles. And of course, you're tempted to say, well, can we just find out the environmental impact of cat pictures on the web? But of course, that's not really what was meant. But um, if you look at Web 2.0 as the read-write web, the web we do, you don't just consume, but where you actually produce into, then maybe we should think smart grid as a read-write grid. So much for one. Chapter two. Little under two years ago, Japan was hit by a devastating tsunami and suffered much worse catastrophe afterwards um, when the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant um, failed critically, uh, had, a, had a nuclear meltdown, exploded several times, um, and the whole area got contaminated and had to be evacuated. The problem at that time was that nobody knew what was going on. Uh, the government held back crucial information um, because they feared panics. For good reason. If I knew that a nuclear power plant in my neighborhood had exploded, I'd probably panic as well. But withholding information from the public is never a good idea because that will make the public panic much worse. And it will inspire the hackers. Um, in the aftermath of the uh, 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 Fukushima Daiichi disaster, um, the Tokyo hackerspace got donated some old lab equipment from the United States. This is a 70s era Geiger counter. Uh, long out of use in the United States, but still calibrated. That is crucial. And still with a working audio output. So what the Tokyo hackerspace did was couple the audio output with a Arduino, which counted the clicks, which then relayed that to a Wi-Fi board, which relayed that information to another Wi-Fi board that was inside. Um, so they basically had an internet-connected Geiger counter in the center of Tokyo, um, getting information out. Um, it inspired other initiatives like SafeCast. I don't know whether any of you have heard of SafeCast, but I find this really interesting. This is an, as a prototype board for the iGeige, a Geiger counter which you just plug into your iPhone and it automatically relays Geiger counter information to the web. Uh, now, these two things would have been marginally interesting if it was just about the things they represent. What makes them really interesting is that they feed their data into the web. Um, this is a cousin page of one of the Geiger counters stationary, um, where they're visible to all. Now, those people, they send out that data. Um, they didn't much care what happens then. Uh, the interesting thing is that most of the people who put their uh, radiation data online put it under a CC0 denotation so that everybody could use it, uh, which led to aggregation of that data. Um, this is a map done by a London-based UX designer. Um, she was just fed up with all this data being there, being put out by volunteers, essentially, and they're, no, they're not being a good representation of all that data. So she just whipped that map out. So we got from disaster to ingenious solutions, to putting it on the web, to uh, a nice representation, which gives you the danger areas uh, on a glance in less than a week. Um, it turns out that this map was partially responsible for the toppling of the Japanese government because suddenly people had information in their hands. What I want to say about that is that the best way to complain is to make things. It may be a things, 
be it things on the web, if you have something that annoys you, just do something about it. Don't just complain. Um, and I think, as much as I use this code to inspire, I think it's crucial to understand the web. Um, this is an excerpt uh, from a blog post by a genius writer called Paul Ford. Um, the blog post was called The Web as a Complaint Medium, and he's basically arguing that the web is the web's native form is to express uh, disappointment about not being consulted in decision making. In short, to complain. And we're gonna stick with that even in chapter three. The best way to complain is to make things. Now we are here for an nominal HTML5 conference, so of course, where would we be without this guy? Uh, this, of course, is Tim Berners-Lee. This is an early picture of him. And it's interesting when you read up on the history of the World Wide Web um, that it's really only been invented to complain. Um, this is a physicist at CERN who's really, really annoyed that he can't find the scientific information he needs for his experiments, that he can't keep up to date with what's going on in other places. Uh, he's just really annoyed with how hard it is to get data. So he starts this thing called World Wide Web, um, which in turn leads to Mosaic, the first browser as we know it, and AOL. And there's this whole evolution of the presentation of participation on the web. Um, a little side note, if, if any of you actually subscribe to the notion that the web doesn't ever forget, try finding any screen caps of old GeoCities pages. You won't hardly find any of them. Uh, so this is the XKCD homage to, uh, to an interwebs titan of old. Um, and now we have this whole array, this whole slaughter on of uh, Web 2.0 services. Um, and we talk about all this social, mobile, local. Um, I've actually heard it uh, be, uh, be, be uh, shortened into Somolo. Um, and I just get really angry when I hear that. Um, but of course, there's, there's a driving force behind that. Um, screens get ever smaller. Um, but really, the, the, the most driving force, as we all know, was uh, about five years ago, when the iPhone was released, um, where computing got handheld. And now we're really getting into it. Um, I just want you to have a look at this for a moment. That's the top of the line iMac of 2000. And medium range um, iPhone 4 in 2010. Now look at the specs. The iPhone beats the top of the line iMac of just a decade earlier in almost every respect. Um, now, this is due, as we all know, to Moore's Law. Um, for those not familiar with it, uh, Moore's Law essentially stipulates that the transistor density on any integrated circuit um, doubles every one and a half years. Uh, in more practical terms, um, as usually put as chips get doubly powerful every one and a half years. Um, this, of course, leads to exponential growth, and we all know if we just think back about when, when we first encountered the web, um, how shitty the computers were we used compared to what we have now. Um, but to, to, to really drive that point home, um, here's a pretty image of uh, the Cray 2 supercomputer. It was commercially released in 1985, and had 1.5 gigaflops of capacity, which is to say it could do 1.5 billion floating point operations per second. Uh, this was used to, for, for a variety of things, uh, usually uh, 
satellite tra uh, trajectory calculations, inter -ballist intercontinental ballistics, uh, that kind of thing. It was really expensive machine. Uh, primary customers were uh, Defense Department, NASA, that kind of thing. I have those 1.5 gigaflops in mind because I suppose most of you have that capacity at hand right now. And that's only, what, 25 years later. Um, this is Moore's law, and that's what exponential growth does. It shrinks the same computing, computation, makes it just that much cheaper. But not only Moore's law is interesting, what I, having just talked about the energy background where I come from, find even more compelling is Kumi's law, which is kind of a corollary to Moore's law. Kumi's law essentially states that the energy efficiency of chips double every one half years. That is to say, uh, the same amount of computation takes half the energy than one half years before. Uh, to drive that point home, we have here uh, a Siemens Nixdorf PCD3 NSL, um, one of the first widely commercially available laptops in Germany. Um, I think it had a top, ca a top rate of 20 megahertz. Uh, had a rated um, battery life of three and a half hours, that which for that time was great. Um, yeah, let's contrast that with what's now top of the line. Um, I think this has a battery rating of seven hours, but what I find really interesting, if we took that machine and applied the energy efficiency standards of just 20 years earlier of that machine, um, what would be your best guess how long this machine on the old energy standard with the same battery would survive? Any takers, guessers? Seconds. It's, it's in the range of seconds. It would be one and a half seconds flat. Now, these two things would be enough to, uh, to, to explain this graph and this comparison. Uh, it gets cheaper, it needs less power. Um, but we're not talking about the iPhones right now, we're talking about things getting connected to the app. So let's talk about Mackel's Law. Mackel's Law is, I think, really, really important to anybody who works on the web. Uh, because it explains what we usually frame as network effects. And uh, what it essentially says is that the value of a network grows exponentially to the number of its nodes, because every new node you attach to a network will create connections to not only one other point in one other node in the network, but usually a lot of other points in the network. That's why the internet, now this is a graph of a snapshot of the known internet taken about three years ago. That's why the internet looks as it is and why it's so resilient, um, and that's pretty much by design. Uh, that's why Facebook is so defensible. Um, so in short, we have the cost going down, we have the energy consumption going down, and we have the value going straight up. Um, the more things we attach to the internet, the more valuable the internet gets. So we have inherent motivation to, uh, um, to put the web into stuff. It's viable, it's feasible, and we really want to do it. Um, that's where it boils down to why I believe and why I bet my career on Internet of Things, because those three laws just make a compelling case for uh, basically everything getting connected to the web. Chapter 4. The first internet was a place you went to. You dialed up or logged in. It was over there, and you were here. The new internet is just here. It's all around us. It's constant, ubiquitous, and pervasive. We interact with it so naturally that there seems to be no user interface at all. Does it ring true to anybody? I think so. The new internet is in our phones and in our homes. It's in our refrigerators, thermostats, and cars. It's on our bodies. We ourselves are actually part of the internet. Uh, that's a recap of uh, this year's CES. And although I have not been there, and all my friends who have been there thought it was treacherous, um, there's an undeniable trend. Um, the internet is just getting everywhere. It's not something that you do as a separate thing, uh, the internet is. And I think 
that speaks true for most of us here, the internet is actually a very big part of our all lives nowadays. But how does it look when the internet gets into our cars, into our lives? Not just with our phones or our laptops, but in the mundane. Uh, in Berlin, we have a really nice service, a, a car sharing service, um, where you can just open up an app or go onto the website, um, check uh, for them to geolocate me, and they will find me the nearest car. I can then just go ahead and book that car, which is usually one of these, uh, stands wherever in the city. Uh, I open it up with an RFID chip I have on my driver's license, um, and off I go. This, of course, only works because those cars are connected to the internet. Those cars are part of the service, they're the service essentially, but that service is only possible because those cars interact with the internet, and the internet is one gateway for me to use the service, it's a facilitator for the service, the service is still the car, uh, but it's hugely dependent on the internet. We're at the stage now where cars get software updates. This is the software update for the Ford Sync platform, um, which is actually quite nice for, for taking a lot of the uh, capabilities which you have in your phone and make them accessible in your car. Um, one example, uh, probably a lot of you know, is the Nest smart thermostat. It's uh, designed by uh, Tony Fadell, the uh, designer of the original iPod. Uh, that's why you probably see why the shape's like that. Um, and it's really interesting, uh, not only because it learns, and it has more sensors than your current top-of-the-line Nexus 4 or iPhone 5. Um, it learns when you're away, it adjusts your heating accordingly. Why that is really interesting is that once you set it up, you actually never have to touch the object again. Because you could as well all do it just via the app. Maybe Android, iPhone, or even via the web. Um, you now have a computer in your house which lets you control the house from your smartphone in a very mundane way. Although I still presume uh, most people will prefer uh, the actual object as opposed to the iPhone app because it's really kind of cumbersome to set your heating on the iPhone. Um, there's another example which is, um, I don't know, who knows this? Um, two hands. Okay, not a lot of people. Uh, it's the Withings Smart Body Scale. Uh, what it essentially is, is a body scale that talks to your Wi-Fi and sends your weight to a server um, to basically do one job that most people dread, uh, which is keeping track of your weight. If you step onto, uh, onto a scale, uh, usually you're not really interested in a snapshot data of what is my weight now, but you're interested in the trend curves. Other objects, uh, which are getting connected to the web, which are really mundane, are lamps. We now have an influx of what's slated Wi-Fi lamps. Uh, this is the Philips U. Uh, this is the LifeX, which was a Kickstarter project, and which makes me dub. Uh, we're soon going to have an, a folder on our phones, which is all the different lamps we have in our houses. Um, and another example, um, the Belkin Wemo, uh, which is basically a remotely controlled switch for your appliances. Um, now, of course, I find this interesting because I'm really interested in how people interact uh, with technology on a mundane level, how they use technology to help them with their everyday tasks. This is not the headlines uh, that the people, uh, that the ma big manufacturers uh, look for. Um, yeah, this is the idea of the smart kitchen by LG. It's essentially Android controlled everything in your household. And um, luckily, there's a funny side to this after all being the internet. Um, I really want you to check out fuckyeahinternetfridge.tumblr.com. It's awesome. So yeah, technology has to kind of be appropriate about where it's, it's put in. 
Uh, now, here's a shocker for most of you. Uh, all that stuff I'm talking about, like the connected kitchen, is actually not really that new. Uh, there has been a software package in 1986. 1986, released for the C64. Uh, it's called the X10 Powerhouse and was um, home automation software. Uh, you could control your house with your computer. So the concept is, is reasonably old, um, which we're going to touch on. Here. Um, what I find so interesting about that is that it shows how little we've evolved from this old idea of home automation compared to that, because that's just one line. If you then look at what I've shown you earlier um, about how the web evolved from you know, this one guy complaining about not getting access to research data on physics to uh, geocities where people just could produce to what we now call the Web 2.0, uh, makes me wonder where we're headed, if, if I can all excite you enough to invest some time into this technology and to figure out the new metaphors on how to make this work for people and how to make people participate in that. Because after all, uh, there will be about 15 billion devices uh, in just two years from now, uh, 40 billion by 2020. These are the estimates by Cisco, and I must say uh, they're on the pessimist end of the estimates I've seen in my life. Um, I think they're also more realistically uh, realistic, but it could just explode. Um, so what I mean if, if, if I say I want you to think about how to put this to use in a mundane but useful way, um, web servers are increasingly not going to have any screens at all. Uh, this is the glow cap. Uh, it's a sensor and a pill bottle. Uh, it's meant to be given to, I don't know, the elderly, people you care for, uh, people where you know they have a history with non-compliance and taking their medication. It will register uh, when people take their pills. It has a base station which will flash and do an acoustic sound uh, when it's two hours after you should have taken your pill. And it will call a central dispatcher who will then call the patient if it's three hours after they should have taken a pill. Uh, this is all done on a server. This is a web service for all intents and purposes. It just happens to live without a screen. And I think it's really interesting, and this is one of the most useful examples of the IoT I've seen yet, because that actually helps save lives. Um, I really like another product another web service that completely works without a screen. Um, this is the Goodnight Lamb. It's, it's a project of a good friend of mine. Um, you can back it on Kickstarter. It's a place to. It's awesome. Um, uh, what this is, is a family of connected lamps. So you have this big lamp, and you can pair as many little lamps, you see them there, as you want. What happens then is, wherever you are, once those little lamps and the big lamp have an internet connection, you turn off on the big lamp, little lamps go on. Turn off the big lamp, little lamps turn off. Um, what this does, I mean, it's all obviously mediated over the web, but what it does is it gives ambient intimacy. Um, it makes communication over the web less, uh, less explicit. I mean, you all know this, so when you communicate on the web, you always have to do that in explicit statements. You have to type or you have to speak, otherwise the other, the other side just won't get what you're on about. This um, makes like, living a real life over the web much easier and much more intimate. And then, of course, I think everybody knows these. Um, it's a little printer, another web service uh, that lives completely without a screen. Um, this is a... Really, it's a tiny printer, it's a tiny thermos printer with a web service at the end, and it can give you daily weather forecast, or uh, it, you can give the address, your name on the little printer network to your friends, and they can send you little messages to your kitchen, presumably. It's a really interesting concept, it's really nicely done, um, and it works really well without a screen, completely without a screen. And we were just talking about um, this, um, this is 
coming back slightly into the screens, um, the Belkin, I love Belkin for them have an open API. And I was just talking about um, how I fear that our phones are going to be littered with con remote controls for three kinds of different lights at my place. Um, what we need to push for, and Puri, Puri how, do, how do I pronounce your name? Puri. Puri. Uh, just mentioned it, uh, the, the open environment we need to, we need to, to, to build. Um, it's partly open APIs. Uh, so this is just a mundane switch, but what, it ha what the open API enables it to do is interesting stuff like that. Uh, who knows if this, then that? Okay, please do me a favor, all of you who know if this and that. If you later at some stage find somebody who doesn't know them, tell them about it. It's a great service for automating the web. It's a great service for making the web work for you because it, you can create really interesting recipes, they call it, and it can be as easy as if the sun sets, turn on my living room light. This only works, and this is a website, a web service, nominally, uh, that interacts with my home without my doing anything other than setting up the uh, uh, other than setting up this recipe in the first place um, so yeah um, if if stuff has open apis of course the web services will follow and the web services will be increasingly targeted at machines rather than us coming back to this i encourage you to follow this um, it's really easy to start creating for the Internet of Things. Uh, there's the Arduino, which is really cheap and really easy to program with. There's um, the Raspberry Pi, which is a full-powered uh, computer for as little as $35. Um, the Internet of Things is coming, and I'm, I'm, I'm always slightly amused when I'm labeled a visionary, because as you've seen, I wasn't really talking about what's to happen. All I'm saying is what's already out there on the edges, um, what this means. Uh, what this means for you all is um, that the web isn't only on the screens anymore. So please, get cracking. Are there any questions? No? Well then, Thank you for your attention and have a nice conference. Hey, th thanks, Martin. So I, I think I warned you and some of the other speakers that uh, Finns might be a bit quiet <laughs> until they ask really, really difficult questions. So difficult questions are okay. You can go insanely detailed. That, that's fine. <laughs> but all right. Um, yeah, fascinating talk. Thank you. Actually, one of, one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about is that you mentioned CES a couple of weeks ago in uh, Las Vegas, and I also took a look at the news and a lot of the IoT stuff and putting internet everywhere and why the F do I actually need to <laughs> the tweet on my fridge. But I, I think one of the things that pointed out from the reporting was that how hideous a lot of the UIs and how hideous a, yep. a lot of the UX on the machines was. So I think that's kind of a concrete call to action also for all of us here that are creating tech or creating design that I, I think there's a whole lot of room to what it really innovate and yeah. actually actually make it better on that front. What it really boils down to is that we as designers on the internet age, we kind of automatically think of interfaces as screens. And right. uh, there's been this article that's making the rounds late last year was like the best interface is no interface at all. And what all that told me was that the writer of this article really had no idea what an interface actually is. Right. Because, you know, the feeble light switch is, is the most intuitive interface that was ever designed. Um, so we're going to increasingly have to design interfaces which just aren't screens. And exactly. most people right. can't wrap their heads around that. Yeah. Where are... Please, go yeah. ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, when something becomes wireless, there's also big risks. I've heard of uh, stories where someone could like take control of uh, car brakes or like disable them, or then like control somebody's uh, uh, heart <laughs> pacemakers. <laughs> uh, what do you think of that? Um, 
what do I think of that? That's uh, early technology hijinks. Um, of course, you know, if you think back of the old DOS environments, how, how fatally flawed they were in, in terms of antivirus protection, and uh, we've just evolved to keep up with the threats that are out there. Um, of course, car manufacturers should think about the, the software they put on onto their chips to, to improve security. Um, unfortunately, most of the areas which are just now getting computerized, like cars or electricity meters, that's companies that are not usually working with computers. Uh, so they don't ha necessarily have security at, their back, at the back of their minds. Uh, we need to change that, of course. Uh, this all needs to be get much more secure. Um, on the pacemaker example, I've read about this as well, but uh, really, there's a, 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 you can disable any pacemaker with a small electro electromagnetic shock. There's some risks we just take for granted every day. Uh, you can't protect yourself against all odds. Okay, uh, I'll be here all day, so if you have any further questions, just hit me up. All right. Thanks again, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah.